Good morning, everybody. Good to see you. Let me try it again. Good morning, everybody. There we go. Good to see you. We're so glad you're here. And uh, what a beautiful day in North Carolina. Come on, the sun is shining. And uh, we were on a, on, a, on a streak of 36 degrees in rain. And praise the Lord, the sun is shining. But most importantly, I pray that the power of the Holy Spirit is moving here, right? Amen, everybody, and online, and we're so glad that you're here, and these are exciting times. Uh, we are in a series based on the book of Philippians, so if you have your Bible, you can go ahead and turn to Philippians chapter 3 and get you something to take notes with. If you have a journal, uh, I heard that we sold out of journals in the cafe. I'm not sure if we have replenished them yet, not yet, but they're coming. They're on the way, but uh, so... Uh, how awesome is that, that you sell out of journals to take notes at church, right? So um, if you don't have a journal, borrow some paper from somebody around you and take notes on your phone or whatever works for you. The important thing is that we not only hear the Word of God, but we allow it to get in us and through us. Just a little uh, personal story. I was 18 years old, a freshman in college, and that's when I began. I noticed my buddy... Uh, David Knauss uh, from upstate New York, taking notes of, of, during chapel. And I, I said, why do you do that? He said, well, it helps me stay awake and it helps me remember. I'm like, well, that's pretty good. I was falling asleep and distracted the whole time, you know. I started taking notes when I was 18 years old, a freshman in college, and I've been taking notes ever since. And I have journals, and I have my phone filled up with notes, and I have, uh, and can you imagine... I, that was a long time ago, y'all. <laughs> and uh, many of the people that I heard preach are in heaven now. A lot of them are. And I have their notes. And their message lives on in my heart and in my life. And it's just powerful. I just want to give you a little why behind the what when I say we're a note-taking church. Because uh, there, there's power behind that. Because 10 years from now, you might need this message even as much as you do right now. Right? Or you might be helping somebody who needs hope. <laughs> and like, hey, I, I heard a message about 10 years ago. And... I still have my notes from it, right? And uh, so today we're going to talk about focus. Everybody say focus. The focus of joy. The whole theme of this book of Philippians, Paul, as a, as a refresher, Paul is in prison for preaching the gospel. He's in a Roman prison, and, uh, and he writes this letter to the church of Philippi, which a church that he had started ten years, about 10 years prior to this, and he's writing this to them to strengthen the church, to, to, uh, to help them, because they were dealing with some stuff. A 10-year-old church, you know, you kind of, every season you kind of start dealing with some stuff. And there was some negativity that was creeping in, and there was some, some challenges taking place, and a religious spirit that was trying to sneak in, and all these things that weren't there at the beginning. And, and so he writes this letter, and his, his, the whole theme of the book is joy. Um, and, uh, but let me remind you that we will conclude this series next Sunday, so go ahead and begin reading Philippians 4 for next week. Uh, the next week we have Pastor Dino Rizzo will be here preaching for us. Come on, somebody. We all love Pastor Dino. He's not only hilarious, but he's, uh, he's looking forward to being here. I was texting him yesterday. And then, um, and then March 14th is our Legacy Commitment Sunday. Come on, somebody. Most of you know, if you haven't listened to the vision message I shared in January, uh, you can go online and listen to that. And then March 20, it gets better, y'all. March 21st is our Legacy Miracle Offering. So, come on. Lots of excitement. And then in six weeks, everybody say six weeks, is Easter Sunday. Come on. And uh, go ahead and pick out your Easter outfit. Hope you got your Easter outfit. Right? Uh, and uh, whatever that looks like, this will be my Easter outfit. But, um, but we're going to add a service on Easter Sunday, 7.30, 9 o'clock, and 10.45. How many of you guys are excited about a 7.30 service? Woo! Come on. Uh, on Easter Sunday, it's just kind of cool getting up a little extra early and do your own personal devotional as the sun rises and then come here for the 7.30 service, right? <laughs> so... Anyways, I'm just excited about just uh, all that God is doing. And um, somebody uh, recently sent a, you know, have been making comments. They're like, don't cut out the dad jokes, you know. And I'm like, I didn't know they were dad jokes. I just thought they were jokes. Because I've been telling dad jokes since I was in middle school. 
And I know there were dad jokes back then, but apparently they're dad jokes. And I, def- I heard a definition of when you know it's a dad joke or not. When does, a, when does it become a dad joke when the punchline is apparent? <laughs> Come on, that's good right there, isn't it? I thought that was, I, I've been waiting all week to tell you that. I've been waiting all week. My daughter, Caroline, is, is in town for a few days, and she has a little puppy, and it's wide open. It's a, a Morky, half Maltese, half Yorkie, and, uh, and it is, uh, I mean, it goes 100 miles an hour. Everything he does, everything she does is fast, and her name is Joy. And so uh, the other day, Martha uh, was downstairs doing something, and, and little Joy, just a few months old, was upstairs in her little, her little place, her little pen, taking a nap. And Martha said, hey, can you, go, can you get Joy I said, Martha, James 1, I've been counting it all joy all day. <laughs> and she didn't think it was very funny, but she, I got a little courtesy laugh. But James 1 says, count it all joy. So we're going to talk about joy today. There we go. Our, our scripture for last week that you're going to memorize is Philippians 2.5. Can we say it together out loud? This is our verse that I encourage you to memorize. Ready? You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Let's say it again. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Good job, you guys. Awesome. So, focus. Focus is important. Without focus, we can lose purpose. Without focus, we can get distracted. Without focus, we lose direction. In in 2004... The Olympics of 2004 in Greece. There was a guy named Matt Emmons who competed in the three position rifle competition. And he was way ahead of everybody else. On the final round, all he had to do at the last target was just hit the target. He didn't even need a bullseye. And he would win the gold medal. He was that far ahead. He aimed his rifle, bullseye. Wrong target. He went from getting a gold medal to eighth place. Why? Because he was focusing on the wrong target. There's a picture, you can find it on the internet, of his face. What his face looked like when he realized that he had hit the wrong target. Can you imagine? All he had to do was even just hit the target. He didn't even have to get a bullseye. I think many people like that, maybe in 2020, they lost focus. Maybe even right now, we're, we're, we think we have focus, but we're focused on the wrong target. I'm going to help you today get focused on the right target. Yeah. Amen, everybody? Amen. Let's get focused on the right target. <laughs> Hopefully, you'll clap a little bit more at, after I preach. <laughs> Philippians chapter, I'm having fun with you guys, right? Philippians chapter 3, verse 1. Whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. I never get tired of telling you these things. And I do it to safeguard your faith. Verse 2. Watch out for those dogs. Those people who do evil. Those mutilators who say you must be circumcised to be saved. For we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence in human effort. Though I could have confidence in my own effort, if anyone could. Indeed, if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I am a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin. A real Hebrew, if there ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demand the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done for me. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared to the infinite value of knowing Christ, Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ 
and become, become one with him, I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. Verse 10, key verse. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another I will experience the resurrection from the dead. Let's stop there. We'll pick up the scripture a little bit farther down in a moment. So what should we focus on? Or who should we focus on? Paul tells the church of Philippi, and he's telling us today through the scripture, we should focus on Jesus. We should make it our desire that what's the bullseye is to know Christ. You know, our vision here at C3 is to provide real hope for real people in a real world. And we do that four ways through helping people to know God, find freedom, discover their purpose, and make a difference. But knowing God, how many know knowing God is not just about salvation? You can know you're going to heaven, but it, it, it's continually growing closer and closer in your walk with Christ and knowing him more and more intimately all the time. We never stop growing and knowing who Christ is. It's like getting married and saying, you know, we, now that we're married, we don't have to talk anymore. <laughs> I already know you. You're my wife. That's it, right? It's like saying, you're my savior. I'm going to heaven. I know you. Check. No, it, it's a continuation. And Paul is pleading with the church of Philippi, and he's pleading with us. And he's even declaring, I want to know Christ. I've tried it the religious way. I've tried it the world's way. I want to know Christ. And he says, and the power of the resurrection. But he says there's some joy killers. Each scripture that we're reading here, we're seeing that there, he says to have joy, to rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. But he also warns the church of Philippi. That there are some joy killers. Verse 2, watch out for those dogs. Those people who do evil. Those mutilators who say you must be circumcised to be saved. Who is he talking about? That word dogs, it's like a pack of wild dogs. He's not talking about the lost. He's not talking about people who don't know Christ. He's talking about the religious people. How many you know sometimes religious people can be divisive? can be negative, can divide the church. And it's very deceptive because they look holy and they look happy on the outside. But on the inside, they have a spirit of negativity, of divisiveness, and the devil can use them. Sometimes I don't even think they realize the devil's doing it. The devil can use them to sneak in and try to cause division with religion. There's religious people who trust in their own works who Paul's referring to here, that you must be circumcised on the eighth day and all these rules and regulations. There's negative people who spread subtle lies. My story is, this scripture is very personal to me. Some of you have heard the story. If you read the book that I wrote called I Am, I share the story in that book. But I was in, at that time, I was on staff at a church. I was a youth pastor and I um, was... uh, was in between churches at the time, <clears throat> and uh, I was traveling on the weekends and speaking at churches and, and uh, youth camps, youth revivals. Uh, I mean, I would just, I would go anywhere to, 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 to share uh, the gospel, and, and so I was doing that on the weekend, um, and then during the week, I got a job as a part-time custodian, which uh, actually I was very thankful and blessed to have that job. And which I have a whole new appreciation for anybody who works in that, in that field. Um, and uh, it was during that season that God really broke me. You know, I just uh, really humbled me. Because up until then, my identity had always been in something else. In particular, now at that time, my, 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 my significance, my identity was in being the youth pastor at a large church in that city. And that was, that was important to me because that was my identity. If you were to ask me at that time, so tell me about yourself. Who are you? I'm Matt Fry. I'm the youth pastor at such and such church. Oh, that's, 
That's a big church. I know, you know, big deal. I'm important. You want some counseling or something? I, I, I'm pretty smart. I'm a big deal. And, and so I would never say that, but that's, that was kind of my identity. It was like, I, and then that was taken away, and I was just, I was just Matt. Matt Fry, if you, I'm, the, I'm, I'm part-time custodian. I clean your office, by the way. I clean the cl- police station. When, when you clean a police station, you, the police have to be there, right? So you, they have to have securities. And so I'm cleaning a police station and, and uh, one, one particular office. I can remember like it was yesterday. <laughs> and a policeman was there sitting behind his desk. And I said, excuse me, sir, can I, can I get that trash can from you? I, listen, I have, I've been to seminary. I've been a youth pastor for like 10 years. You know, that was all I knew to do. I was trained to be a minister. And, and I said, excuse me, sir, can I get that trash can for you? And he pulled He said, of course. He said, but he said wait a second. Don't I know you? Aren't you Matt Fry, the youth pastor of the church down the street? I said, well, I, I used to be. I said, uh, but, but can I get that trash can for you? <laughs> and so I entered the trash can. And, and that was that day. I went home, sat on my couch. And uh, I was reading the scripture. And I got to Philippians 3.10. Paul says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. And I remember thinking, Lord, I need some power right now. I need the power of the resurrection. I mean, I'm, I'm going through a hard time. I need your power. And he says, then, then it goes on to say, then I want to suffer with him. And he says, if you really want my power, which I think it's interesting that Paul mentions power of the resurrection first. He doesn't mention the death of Christ first. He mentions the power of the resurrection. I think that's very intentional. Because if you want to know the power of the Holy Spirit, everybody wants power, right? You want power. Well, are you willing to suffer? Are you willing to go through the suffering to experience the power? And all of a sudden, it was like a light bulb went on. And I'm like... I'm not Matt Fry, a wrestler. I'm not Matt Fry, an athlete. I'm not Matt Fry, a college student. I'm not Matt Fry, a youth pastor. I'm Matt Fry, a child of God. That's my identity. What I do is secondary. And I remember just getting emotional, going, Lord, I want to know Christ. I want to know you. And if I have to go through this suffering, if that's what it takes to get these titles and these labels ripped off of me, So be it. And God will do the same for you. And you know, it sneaks back. It's not one and done. you got to keep praying that prayer. Because before you know it, you start finding your identity in success or failure. What somebody said about you. And I've had to take off a lot of labels since then. In fact, just about every day, I have to take off a label that the devil tries to put on me. Like, you're a failure. You're not good enough. You're not a good husband. You're not a good dad. You're not a good pastor. You're not a whatever. You know, all these lies, right? You're weak, whatever. And he takes these lies, and they can be, if they attach to you, they can become labels. Well, I'm a child of God. And as a believer, you're a child of God. You know what, what that means is we have a heavenly daddy who loves you so much. I love that new song that we sang today. You're not walking alone. You have a heavenly daddy who loves you. So discover who you are in Christ and declare who you are in Christ. And then Paul tells us in verse 12, he says, I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection, but I press on to possess the perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. Everybody say, forgetting the past. Everybody say, looking forward. Forgetting the past, looking forward to what lies ahead. So so we, we can learn from the past, right? We all should learn from the past, but you can't live in the past. You can't stay there. You say, oh, you know what? That, that didn't go the way I thought, right? So what can I learn from that? How can I grow? Every person who has experienced success for the cause of Christ has experienced failure. One of the best books I wrote, 
I wrote, <laughs> I wish I'd written it, I read, <laughs> is a book from, by John Maxwell called Failing Forward. It's a great book, by the way. And it just talks about how, you know, if you're going to be successful in life, you have to be willing to fail. Otherwise, you're going to live in the safe zone. But when you live in the faith zone, that's when you experience the power of God. And uh, it, it requires us be, to be willing to fail, but we can't live in the past. And this year, our, I've been declaring victory, that this is the year of victory. We don't, we don't pray for victory, we pray from victory, because he's already won the victory. He rose from the grave and declared, I am victorious. And every Sunday, by the way, is Easter Sunday. Yeah. We have here at C3, we have what we call connect groups, and... They meet throughout the week, and many of you are involved in them. If you haven't gotten involved, it's not too late. There's many connect groups that still have space available. Uh, we have a brand new group that just started meeting you might be interested in. Uh, it's a couples group, by the way. It meets Thursday night, 7 o'clock in the conference center. Yes, thank you for that. And I and, and, uh, just want to give you a little heads up because they just started. So uh, some of the groups have been going for a couple of weeks but this one just started, and it's in particular, it's, it's a continuation, kind of a follow-up to our marriage conference. And so it's an EXO marriage connect group at 7 o'clock uh, on Thursday nights. But if you're interested, just check, out, check it out on the website or ask somebody uh, if you're here physically in the lobby at the New Here area. And then we see Philippians 3.14. I press on. To reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. So we must, Paul says we must forget the past and we must press on. Everybody say press on. What does that word press on mean? What does that phrase, what does it, what does it mean when Paul says, I want you not only to forget the past, but I want you to press on? In English, the word I press is one word in Greek that Paul would have used. And it's, it's, uh, it's dioko, D-I-O-K-O, pronounced dioko, which literally means to take flight or to run swiftly. It's not just like I'm going to kind of head this way. It's like I'm going to swiftly head that way. I'm going to take off like a plane's taken off. How you know a, a plane, when it takes off, it has to get some momentum. It's not going from standing still to in the air. So this word, I press, dioko, literally means to take flight, to run swiftly. And then it says, to, I press on, that word, two words, on toward, is one Greek word. So in English, it's on toward, I press on toward. On toward in Greek is spelled E-I-S, which is pronounced ice. So dioko, ice. In Greek, when he was writing this, he would have written geoko ice, which literally means I run swiftly because on toward means uh, to, to move toward a purpose in the Greek. So it's to run swiftly toward your purpose, which comes from God. So, so it's much richer and deeper than just, oh, I'll press on. I'll give it another day. No. Paul says, I'm going to run swiftly towards the purpose that God has for me. I'm not going to just live in the past anymore. But I'm going to wake up, I'm going to stand up, and I'm going to run forward. I'm going to press on toward the purpose, not my purpose, but his purpose that he has for me. Isn't that good news, everybody? How many of you want to press on? Everybody shout, press on. So, are we pressing on towards the goal? Are you pressing on towards the goal? The purpose that God has for you? Today's an exciting day. Today could be your day. This could be your game changer day. This could be your defining moment. This could be your day where you say, I'm no longer going to live in the past. And listen, some of you have some, a lot of hurt from the past. Just recently, someone came up to me just in tears. Uh, something, they just been filled with shame. They said, I've never told anybody this in my life. And many people are being set free. I said, today is a breakthrough moment for you. The devil wants you to feel shame. But whenever we are honest and share uh, with, with another believer, that, that's where the healing starts coming, right? And the same is true for you today. You can be set free. We need to know 
that God has called us. Know that he has a purpose for your life and make a decision today to finish strong. And then we see that Paul says that to, to know who God says that I am. Verse 15. Let all who are spiritually mature agree on these things. If you disagree on some point, I believe God will make it plain to you. But we must hold on to the progress we have already made. Dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. For I have told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many who conduct, whose conduct shows that they are really enemies of the cross of Christ. They are headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things. And they think only about this life here on earth. But we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives. And we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. We take our weak mortal bodies and change them. He will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. So we see a few joy killers here. He he talks, rejoice in the Lord always, but hey, watch out, here's some joy killers. Uh, Those that may be around you that think that their, their God is their appetite. And I don't mean just what they eat, could be, but it just means the things that they consume from the world. Uh, They're looking to the things of the world to try to fill the void. It's like, if you know the story of the woman at the well, she went to get physical water and Jesus declares, what? I am the living water. If you drink from the water I give you, you'll never thirst again. Many people at the church of Philippi in that area, where where their God was their appetite. Their stomach was their God. Number two, they, they bragged about shameful things. Rather than bragging about God, they were bragging about shameful things. Paul says in Galatians 6, verse 14, As for me, may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, my interest in this world has been crucified. And the world's interest in me has also died. And then he, he, another thir- uh, third joy killer, those who are earthly minded. Being earthly minded is a joy killer. How many know that this this world will let you down? If you put your hope in the world, it's going to let you down. But we must know who God says that I am. I love this scripture. I think this this could be the most important message of the whole series. Because our passion above all else should be, Lord, I, I want to know Christ. And when we discover who we are in Christ and we take some of these labels off and some of the hurt from the past. We understand, we discover who we are in Christ. I'm a child of God. I'm a, I'm a warrior of the king. I'm a, I'm a princess of the king. I'm more than a conqueror. And then we understand that God has a purpose for us to live out. And he says in verse 20, but I, we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives and we eagerly, we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. One of the 31 I am declarations that's in the end of the, at the end of the I am book is I am a citizen of heaven. I am a citizen of heaven. See, in that time, the, in Philippi, Philippi was considered a Roman colony at that time, which was a big deal. So to say I'm a Roman citizen, that was, oh, you're a Roman citizen. But Paul's like, more than being a Roman citizen, how about we declare, I'm a citizen of heaven. (laughs) I'm not of this world. I'm just passing through. My citizenship is in heaven. So, know who you are. Know whose you are. And know where you're going. Know who you are, I'm a child of God. Know whose you are, I have a heavenly daddy. And know where you're going. My, my citizenship is not on earth. I'm a, I'm a child of God. I have a heavenly daddy. And, and one day, I'm going to go to heaven. 
But until then, I can also declare that I don't, I'm not just a citizen of heaven when I get there. I'm a citizen of heaven right now. Right now. And maybe you're here today and you say, you know, I'm not sure I'm a Christian. I'm not sure I'm a citizen of heaven. I, I, I like what you're saying. Some of it's kind of new. But I would, I would like to know for sure that Jesus is my Savior and Lord. I want to give you an opportunity right now. Those online, here in this room, wherever you are, some of you may be watching this delayed. You may be listening to this delayed as you're driving to work. But it's, there's no, it's not a coincidence that you're listening to this message right now. And God wants you to know that he loves you. He died for you. He rose from the grave. So you wouldn't have to live in the mess that you're in right now. And so you could have eternal life in heaven. In Romans chapter 10, verse 9 says, If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. In verse 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be what? Saved. Will you pray with me right now? Come on, believers are going to join us to encourage those who may be praying for the first time. Would you say, dear God, I realize that I've sinned and I need you. Thank you for dying on the cross and for rising from the grave. Come into my heart. And save me. Thank you for giving me eternal and abundant life. Help me to live for you the rest of my life. In Jesus' name. And everybody shouted. Come on, can we celebrate all those who made the decision to follow Jesus? Hey, thanks for joining us today. And if you made a decision to follow Christ or would like to take your next steps, if you will text C3 Space Connect to 474747, we will be sure and get you all the information you need. Now, let me encourage you to share this message and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more messages. Hey, listen, we pray you guys have a blessed week.